and he goes, shh, you gotta, you know, somebody. No, there's not. No, there's not. You know, you don't believe me? Come see. There's a body in the bathtub. On August the 18th, 2005, the discovery of a young woman's body would anger and devastate the community of West Campus, Austin, Texas. With clues pointing towards a disturbed individual known as Colton Petoniak, the frantic hunt for his location would trigger international investigations, wrap up other suspicious characters, and ultimately involve a Mexican SWAT team. What happened to Jennifer Cave? Had she been betrayed by one of her best friends? And what led her to her untimely end? Welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. My name is Adrian, and in today's video we're looking at the solved disappearance of Jennifer Cave. Just to let you know, I post solved, unsolved, and strange cases here on a weekly basis, so if that sounds like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffeehouse Crime. So without any further ado, let's begin today's story my friend. Grab a coffee, pull up a seat, and sit back. This is the case of Jennifer Cave. Our story today takes place in the Lone Star State of Texas. Now, Texas is rather infamous amongst the true crime community, and there's plenty of reason why. Although many of us know Texas as a hotspot for violent activity, it doesn't even come close to those states with the highest rate of violence, a title which actually belongs to Alaska. Nevertheless, Texas does have a massive population, and in return, this brings the total number of crimes up quite substantially. Don't let this reputation fool you. It is still a large affluent state with many rich offerings. From the sprawling cityscapes of Austin and Houston, to the arid red sands of its many canyons and national parks, there is something for everyone here. Found within the city of Austin lived a young woman named Jennifer Cave. Jennifer was born on March the 12th, 1984, to her parents Sharon and Charles Cave. She was part of a large and loving family, and one of four siblings. Jennifer grew up in a supportive and safe environment. The six of them all looked out for one another, and they did their very best to support each other as and when they could. As a child, Jennifer was enthusiastic over everything she did, and she took great pride in her education. She studied hard, and threw herself into additional activities such as cheerleading. During the early years of high school, Jennifer's parents would unfortunately separate, leading her mother to find a new partner named Jim Sedwick. Jim was a good man. He took his new family under his wing, and treated Sharon's children just like his own. The newly formed family moved to the coastal city of Corpus Christi, which is Latin for the body of Christ. And if you ask me, this all sounds very Texan. By the year 2002 had rolled around, Jennifer had finally graduated from high school. She had ambitions to work in finance, and saw it as a very reliable future. This led her to explore the universities and colleges which were fairly local to her family. She found herself a spot at Texas State University, which meant that she was finally able to strike out on her own. But sadly, after just one semester, Jennifer dropped out, this resulting in her moving back to Austin. Despite quitting, Jennifer still had the goal of ending up in the finance sector. She realised that she had to start smaller, and therefore she found herself studying finance at the Austin Community College. Now, the city of Austin was getting rather expensive to live in around this time, so Jennifer would study by day and be a waitress by night. She ended up settling into student life quite comfortably, often switching up between studying, working, and of course, partying. Jennifer had a lot of friends, she was very well liked and knew how to have a good time. But unfortunately, as with a lot of college students, this territory and lifestyle can often come with drug use. For Jennifer, this included marijuana and other party drugs, and although she only took these recreationally, she never made it a habit. Her studies meant much more than her party lifestyle. However, this wasn't the case with all her friends, one of which she had grown particularly close to during her time studying in Austin, and his name is Colton Petoniak. Colton was a church boy from Arkansas. Most of his childhood had revolved around the church and doing well by his parents. He attended a junior school called Christ the King School, before progressing to Catholic High School for Boys in Little Rock, where Colton continued to grow and tried his best throughout schooling. This earned him several awards. He was a National Merit Scholar, and placed in the top 10 students in his final year of high school, even taking 166th place in the state of Arkansas. Colton's efforts earned him a scholarship in finance at the University of State in Austin, which makes it unsurprising that eventually he would meet Jennifer. 
Being away from home and from his parents seemed to develop a rebellious streak. As unfortunately, after moving to Austin in the year 2000, Colton became a party animal through the lifestyle that he'd found. This ended up in Colton abusing drugs and alcohol, which he would find hard to shake off. And eventually, Colton was admitted for drug rehabilitation not long after his studies began. The young man frequently relapsed, and in the year 2004, he was caught red-handed by police with cocaine in his possession. He had also unlawfully obtained pills for sleeping and anxiety. Colton pleaded guilty to misdemeanor and served 20 days in prison. Despite this, his lawyer cheekily remarked to say that he was still up to his eyebrows and drugs, and that there was next to no doubt that Colton would continue to misuse. Tying the two worlds together, Jennifer was close with Colton. They knew each other very well, and would often hang out and study together. Jennifer and Colton were never romantically involved, as quite simply, there was no chemistry between them. They even had their own romantic partners throughout this friendship. To add to this, Colton had one ex-girlfriend that was particularly obsessed with him, and her name is Laura Hall. She had previously gone out with Colton and had doted on his every whim, though people around the two would say that actually, he treated her like dirt. Colton grew weary of Laura and ended their relationship soon after it began. But even after this, he was never averse to sharing his bed with her. This is a key piece of information for later. Back to Jennifer. In the year 2005, and after three long years of studying, her course at college was finally coming to an end. But despite this, she didn't want to leave Austin, as she had gained many friends here. So instead, Jennifer began to search for a job in the local area. And in August of 2005, success finally rang through. At long last, she had found work at an Austin law firm, where she was now due to start work as a legal assistant. A decent leg into law, and eventually, finance. Jennifer was immediately on the phone to her mum to give her the exciting news. Sharon could tell that her daughter was over the moon with this job, and was once again self-assured of her life. She was due to begin work on August the 17th, 2005. In order to be fresh and ready for her first day at work, Jennifer planned to get to sleep early, in bed by 10pm, she had told herself. However, that evening, the phone rang. The voice on the other end of the line was Colton. He had just heard about her new job and wanted to congratulate Jennifer. He therefore asked her if she wanted to go out for a couple drinks to celebrate. Now, Jennifer knew she had to be up bright and early for the next day, but she really wanted to chat with a friend about her new job, so she therefore accepted his invitation. It was only for one or two drinks anyway, right? They agreed to meet at 6th Street, the student hotspot for drinking, eating, and partying in downtown Austin. Jennifer took the sensible option by keeping sober, having only a couple drinks with a meal. Whereas Colton, on the other hand, was doing quite the opposite. Throughout the night, he'd excused himself frequently, and displayed a constant stream of alcohol on the go. Luckily, the two weren't alone, but people around them were starting to grow cautious of Colton. And all in the meanwhile, they could see that Jennifer was completely sober. 10 a.m. passed, as did 11 p.m., and then finally midnight. Despite this, Jennifer and the group were still out. Needing to get home for a job in the morning, she wrangled Colton and offered him a lift home, and after helping him find his phone, the two headed out for the night. Just after midnight, Jennifer called one of her friends, Michael Rodriguez. Throughout the call, it was obvious to Michael that Jennifer was trying to control a drunk and high Colton. Michael recalls Jennifer scolding him for punching a car window, and also peeing on another. Michael and Jennifer didn't know each other that well, so he thought it was strange that she was calling him, of all people, this late at night. Asking Jennifer if she was okay, she replied with yes and that there was nothing to worry about. She then told him that she would call him when she got back home safely. Only, that call would never come. August the 17th, 2005. It was an average Wednesday for Sharon, but with an additional positive caveat. Her daughter, Jennifer, was starting a new job today, and she was excited for her. Saying that, the excitement would soon turn to worry, as later that morning, Sharon picked up the ringing phone to hear Jennifer's new manager on the other end of the line. Jennifer hadn't shown up for her first day at work, the position she seemed to be excited about just the very day before. Her stomach immediately dropped, as she too was wondering why Jennifer had failed to message her that morning. She attempted to call her daughter, however, there was no answer. A second, third, and fourth time would all deliver the same outcome, a static click to voicemail. Something wasn't right, and Sharon knew it. Knowing the police would do almost nothing for a missing college student who happened to disappear after a night out, Sharon called up Jennifer's phone provider in hope for some information on her activity. 
Back in the day, when privacy policies were less strict, she was able to obtain several phone numbers that her daughter had called. And one of these numbers was Michael Rodriguez. Speaking to Michael, he told her exactly how the night had played out. That Jennifer had called him around midnight, and that she was with Colton Petoniak. Michael told her that Jennifer didn't seem to be intoxicated, but Colton did appear to be causing her some annoyance on the other end. Colton's number was one of those on the list that Sharon had on file from the service provider, and therefore he was her next point of contact. But while speaking to Colton, he said that he had no idea where Jennifer was, and that she wasn't with him. Sharon did everything that she could from her home in Corpus Christi. She knew what she needed to do next, call the police. Out of courtesy, she called Colton once again to tell him that the police may soon be around to ask him a few questions, as she had now officially reported her daughter as missing. But as the next day crept around, police efforts were slow, and there was still no sign of Jennifer. The silence was obtrusively agonizing. Sharon and her boyfriend Jim were in total anxiety. And so, on that note, they drove to Austin to do some digging of their own. The police told them that Jennifer's car had been located outside of Colton's apartment, but they would now have to wait for a search warrant in order to legally enter. However, in their minds, Sharon and Jim had waited long enough. They drove to Colton's apartment and knocked on his front door. Unfortunately, there was no answer, but Jim wasn't having any of it. He was not going to let so much suspicion slip by like this. And instead, he took matters into his own hands, smashing one of the apartment windows before crawling inside. Despite the small space, the interior of Colton's studio apartment was in disarray, with clothes, mess and other garbage scattered across the floor. Cabinet drawers had been pulled out, and a thick pungency hung in the air. Luckily for Jim, there were only two other rooms in the apartment, so this wouldn't take much time. Walking through the walk-in wardrobe, he could see the bathroom door was ajar, with a light still on. Hesitantly, Jim pushed the door open, and sadly, this action would forever change his life. What he would then find was truly a horrific scene. Lying in the bathtub were the bloody remains of a woman, and even worse, she was in multiple pieces. Her hands and her head had been separated from the rest of her body. The body was wearing a green patterned dress, one of which Jim had recognised. To the girl he had raised like his own daughter, it was Jennifer. Jim was looking at what was left of her, and he knew it. In a distraught panic, Jim ran out of the apartment, and he forbid Sharon to enter and instead, they hastily called 911 to report what they had just found. Within minutes, Austin police had arrived at Colton's apartment. They immediately preserved the scene, and their investigations inside would paint a very gruesome story. In the bathroom lay the body of Jennifer Cave. She was headless and handless. And on the floor next to the bathtub, wrapped up inside a bin bag, was the rest of her. The cause of death was concluded to have been a clean shot to the chest, which would have more or less killed Jennifer instantly. Upon moving the body from the bathtub, Forensics spotted a 9mm bullet casing sitting near the plug, and this bullet would match the handgun found in Colton's car, which hadn't left the premises. Found inside the dishwasher was a machete, lying across plates and cutlery that probably was used for food the day prior. They also found a hacksaw which was used against Jennifer. It was truly an awful scene, and to make things worse, her suspected killer was nowhere to be found. So, the big question, where was Colton? His car was still outside, and it appeared as if he left his apartment without finishing what he'd started. Authorities began to search for the man, and rather foolishly, he had taken his phone with him. 
It turns out that Colton was on a rather long journey, as his phone had been pinging cell towers all the way from Austin and into Mexico. How Colton managed to get there, nobody knew, and that question would remain a mystery for a further four days. That is when police received a phone call from yet another worried parent. Lauren Hall, the father of Laura Hall, which is Colton's ex-girlfriend, was growing worried. Lauren explained to investigators that he received an email from his daughter Laura. In this email, she asked him to entirely gut and empty out her apartment, which was a strange request to get out of the blue. He began to worry that maybe his daughter was with Colton, as he knew she was smitten with him. Armed with this information, and following the pings of Colton's phone, police combed surveillance and road cameras to look for Laura's car, which happened to be a green Cadillac. Fortunately, it wouldn't take long for officers to find an image of Laura's car crossing the border into Mexico. This was at 2.41am on the 18th of August, the night after Jennifer had been murdered. It turns out that Laura and Colton weren't really trying to lie low, as in fact, they seemed to be relatively carefree. This image, taken by one of the hotel owners, showed the two happily smiling away. This was just all one big adventure for them. Needless to say, their getaway plan would be wildly unsuccessful, as the very next day, the two were tracked down at a Holiday Inn found within the town of Piedras Negras. And five days since the murder of Jennifer Cave, a Mexican SWAT team brought their journey to an end. Following their capture, both Laura and Colton were then driven to the Mexico-US border, where Colton was finally arrested and charged for murder. But Laura, on the other hand, she was allowed to leave on her own accord, as there was no evidence to suggest that she was involved in Jennifer's death. This wouldn't stop Laura from being questioned later that day, and this is where suspicions around her involvement started to grow, as she backtracked on several of her statements. Yeah. What's gonna happen? You're gonna go to jail. What did I... <laughs> you gotta tell the truth. Alright, Colton let you in. I sat down, I saw the first. And I was just like, what is this? And I, I, I was like, who, who is, who is this? And he goes, shh. He, he got up, you know, there's a body. No, there's not. No, there's not. You know, you don't believe me? Come see. There's a body in the bathtub. Put the machete on top of it. He said he was gonna cut up the body. Okay. After he told you what he had planned to do with the body. Yeah. Did he ask you to help him? No. He told me to get out of there. After this, he apparently convinced her to flee with him to Mexico, threatening her with a knife if she declined. As a result, she had to go with him. While being questioned and through to court proceedings, Colton pleaded not guilty to the murder of Jennifer Cave. He claimed that he had no recollection of his actions towards Jennifer. Apparently, Colton was so high on drugs and drunk on alcohol that he blacked out during the time Jennifer was helping him to his apartment. And when he finally came back into consciousness, Jennifer was lying dead in his bathtub. It's kind of hard to believe that in a drug-induced daze, Colton then made his way to a local hardware store purchased bin bags, air freshener, cleaning supplies, and a hacksaw, and then made his way back home. One of those working at the shop actually asked Colton what he needed all this stuff for, in which he replied he was going to chop up a turkey. Either way, Colton gave no motive as to why he killed Jennifer, and being honest, prosecutors were struggling to pin one down. After all, Jennifer was no longer around to tell them what happened. Colton argued that apparently, his brain fog was lifting just as Laura arrived at the front door. He then showed her the body, before she allegedly became the driving force in hatching up a plan. Colton then tried to incriminate his friend Laura for mutilating Jennifer's body. This is actually something Laura could not defend herself against, as she was legally advised to stay out of Colton's court proceedings. He also claimed that he could never hurt Jennifer, as he cared way too much for her. Despite his wild claims, the evidence around Colton was so overwhelming, that there was no doubt he killed Jennifer with malicious intent. And as a result, Colton was sentenced to 55 years in prison for the murder of Jennifer Cave. He will only be able to qualify for parole once he has served 50% of his sentence, which means he won't be able to taste freedom until the year 2033 at the very earliest, where he will then be aged 51 at the time. Laura was unfortunately wrapped up in this case, but that doesn't mean she was entirely innocent either. Although she did fight for her innocence and claim she was forced to accompany Colton, she was found guilty for tampering with evidence and hindering to capture a suspect. 
As a result, Laura Hall was sentenced to 10 years behind bars. The judge and jury both believed that she played a key role in dismembering Jennifer, and that she had a motive of jealousy to help dispose of the body and help Colton escape. However, as of August 2018, Laura is once again a free woman. Saying that, she is no longer permitted to return to Travis County or to contact the Kay family in any form. Not that any of them would want that anyway. I can't say that I believe Colton or Laura. Neither of them took full responsibility for their actions. And the truth that we now know today comes from evidence left behind at the scene, as opposed to any sincere ownership. We don't quite know what motivated Colton's actions, nor do we know the exact details of the night that she was murdered, but all of the evidence suggests some form of jealousy or sick fantasy. And as a result, the beautiful life of Jennifer Cave was ended so viciously, so gruesomely, and so abruptly. Even on the night Jennifer was killed, her supportive and caring demeanour showed through. She was helping someone she thought was a good friend in a bad position, and Jennifer, being the kind-hearted woman that she was, could not leave him alone or vulnerable in the middle of the night. Very little did Jennifer realise that by doing so, she was making herself vulnerable. Jennifer was young, ambitious, and ready to get her own life on track after successfully graduating college. Instead, her loving family is left with a hole in their hearts where Jennifer once actively filled, all due to the actions of a sick and twisted so-called friend. Thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. If you found this video interesting or you learned something new, then please remember to like the video and subscribe if you haven't yet. As always, please share your thoughts in the comment section down below, and I'll be back again real soon for another video. But until that moment arrives, please remember to look after each other. Goodbye.